So you, you always feel uh, humbled when you hear a presentation like that. It's, uh, you never would do it the same, uh, in your own words. Um, <clears throat> right there is a picture. It's, um, this is the city where I was born. It's called Kövde, and it's a small town. It's right in the middle between Gothenburg and Stockholm, in the middle of the country. It was a military town. Um, you could easily transport the troops to any part of Sweden from the railroad network. Uh, so it was the military was there, and then this was this factory. And as you can see, it's a fairly big factory, giving its smoke all over the town. And I was raised close to the church in the middle. And uh, that factory was founded by my ancestors. And uh, so I was sort of born into privilege, I would say. And um, I had my first nine years of my life in this city. And this is me as a very small child uh, with my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father, and myself in the middle in a skirt and a frock. And I, I think about time, uh, this is about 70 years ago, and my great-grandfather was, of course, as my grandfather, born in the 19th century. Uh, they did not have running tap water. They did not have electricity. It's, um, it's an amazing achievement that humanity has had during those kind of 100 years or 150 years. And I, I think, uh, I, I like to think of everything as a part of a tradition. I would also say that in Sweden we say that there is one generation that starts things, that are entrepreneurs. There is one generation that inherits, inherits it and takes care of it. And then there is the third generation, my father, who does away with everything. And I'm the fourth, so I don't know what to do. But um, this city, as it lies between Stockholm and Gothenburg, my father used to bring me to art museums in either Stockholm, this is a national museum, or in Gothenburg. So I sort of, he's, and the, the, the place where I could breathe easily was in art museums. And he was absolutely thrilled by art. And this is a tiny piece of art um, that hangs in Gothenburg Art Museum. And it's by Paul Gauguin. And he spent hours sitting and meditating on it and tried in his own way to paint in this sort of way. It's very impressionistic. I got bored, of course, and ran away and looked at other paintings, but my father gave me always pencils, colors, canvases, and more papers to draw on. So I was very encouraged to, to sort of pursue some sort of artistic uh, way in life. The first very, very strong architectural impression on me in my memory is of this film called North by Northwest by Alfred Hitchcock. I presume some of you have seen this when this plane starts to get very aggressive. But there is also a scene in this picture where this villa is. And I was raised on the mountain of limestone and this is a limestone villa. Um, it's kind of bold, I think, uh, with this balcony protruding. Uh, Hitchcock wanted something very authenticity in, in his movies. And so he asked Frank Lord Wright if he could design the villa for the, for the movie. And Frank Lord Wright said, yes, of course I will do that. But then I will have 10% of all the net income on the picture. <laughs> and he didn't get that commission. So they sort of started to do their own fake Frank Lloyd Wright building. So this is a studio-built fake art, Frank Lloyd Wright thing. 
So all my architectural memories are built on a fake architecture, <laughs> which I somehow discovered at a late age. Um, my parents, they sold the, the, the factory. My father didn't want it. Uh, he got immensely rich, as so I have had a very, very privileged background. But he decided to be very anonymous. And from my 10th year, I was living in this fairly humble house. Um, it's a nice house in any sense. And um, from being very, very privileged in Kovda, I was uh, sort of mobbed or not so highly respected in, in Gothenburg. And I, I think that transition to have those different, being very loved, being very respected, to being not loved at all, um, makes a very deep impression on a person. Uh, I simply don't trust people at all. At all. So I feel you're foreigners, <laughs> strangers, you're very, very nasty persons that can pull out a knife at any moment. Um, so I'm a scared person. Very much more scared to talk than you were earlier today. Um, somehow I found these pictures in the early 60s and I, I loved it. Um, of course because of, of the naked bodies in it, but also the very technique of mixing into a collage of things. This is uh, how modern and likable our modern world is by Richard Hamilton done in 1956. And I especially appreciate how you can see the big moon coming and be in the roof of everything. I, I thought it was such a wonder that you could take very Mandjoon pictures and put them together in a very contrasting way. And this is quite far from, from Gauguin, but I got my father to get interested in, in doing collages. And uh, we, we did a lot of collages together during the years. Then I'm of the age of um, this sort of pop music breaking through. And uh, the group that I really, really enjoyed was The Who, because they stated that they loved pop art and Richard Hamilton was pop art. Um, so for that side, I, I got sort of a bit of a rebellious side to me. And I started to enjoy more and more pictures. And I think when I was like 18 years old, I realized that I would not be that brilliant artist that my father wanted me to be. I realized that you had to have some trauma, and even if I was a bit mobbed, I wasn't sufficient for being an artist. I also realized that I liked to live a rather pleasurable life, and that I would like to have an income. And <laughs> There is no way to be an artist and have an income, I'm sad to say. I like this picture, it's slightly later, but there were a lot of new movement French pictures. And they all sort of had the same theme, that you lived a very good life, you had a very good eating, you enjoyed nice wine, and you had a mistress. So I thought, that will be my life. <laughs> and uh, to be that, I realized that I, I could have my interest in art, and, and I would be like an art dealer. So I would go to Paris, I would meet an artist and befriend him early in the morning, and I would buy his picture for 1,000 euro. And then we had my great lunch, and then I would go to my mistress, and then I would go to a dinner party and I would sell the same picture for 10,000 euros. And then I would get drunk and party and sleep everything. That, that was my intention in life. <laughs> and um, so I, that's a picture of me, if you can believe it. <laughs> <laughs> But so, so I started to study economics because my parents knew nothing about economics and I started art history. 
And I was fairly, you know, dedicated because I had two education at the same time. And in the um, study of art, we went to Rome. And this is a picture from 1971 when I'm in Rome. I think I'm at Caracalla's terms. And I sort of got moved uh, by Pantheon and by some uh, rock, no, uh, Baroque buildings like Borromini. And um, when we had the thoughts and the schooling of... Uh, I thought this Pantheon, it moved me and it was 2,000 years old. And I thought about the power of architecture to move people beyond the ages. And when in the education I learned that architecture could be considered an art form, uh, I got fascinated and thought maybe I could be an architect. And at the same time I started to read Casabella, which was the first architectural paper that I got acquainted with. I met uh, the architects of Paolo Portogesi, who also wrote about Borromini and tried to, in concrete, make a modern version of that. And then I was hooked, so I decided to, that I should apply for architectural school too. And happily I got accepted. And uh, so I started about architecture. And somehow the economics, uh, they were, I was failing at that. And I had my thesis in art uh, history and I failed at that. But in architecture school, there was no right or wrong. You could argue. <laughs> you could always say, I'm right, the teacher is wrong. And I found a venue that I was comfortable in. And at that time in Sweden, it was a very rational architecture that was the heyday. And we met, uh, I understood that there was this book, Learning from Las Vegas, and it's Denise Scott Brown on the picture, young Denise. And uh, together with her husband, Robert Venturi, uh, I made discover the book of complexity and contradiction in architecture. And that sort of melted my interest in art history and the sensibilities about the Baroque that I had felt into some sort of modern expressionable architecture. And that moved me very much. And this is me just a few years later. Uh, it's like 74 and I'm visiting Paris. And uh, what really, really made an impression on me was going out to, uh, I think it's called uh, Place de Honoré Blanche, uh, where Fondation uh, Corbusier is, and where this um, Villa Roche is situated. Made in the mid 20s, 1925, I think. Um, made out of um, stone, concrete stone, lime, very traditional construction. But what really, really moved me was this room, um, which was so drastically different from all the bourgeoisie rooms that I grew up in, and with this fluent movement in the ramp between the two um, different scales. So I, I think this visit to that, that was the strongest impression on me to do uh, architecture. In the same time, I also experienced this building in, <coughs> by Toy Ito, done for his sister, <coughs> which is um, simple, um, minimalistic prior to the word existed. And also, I was very, very curious how it was to be living in this curved living room where you always could hide from your enemies or your friends from humans. And also this cut of light into it. I didn't visit it, but I was extremely intrigued by this building. Simple and complex at the same time. Now it is demolished. At the time, I also discovered music in a new way. Um, you get a prize if you know what cover of what record this is. Is there anyone who recognizes it? 
That, that's amazing. <laughs> Why don't you recognize this record? It's, it's about an artist. I think he is the most sample of all. That is George Clinton. Does that name make any sense to you? George Clinton was the founder of a group called Parliament and Funkadelic, and uh, they really break through in like 1978. And I was in New York, and you had all that scene of, of the funk music. And um, his, his bass player is Bootsy Collins, who is the nephew of uh, Snoop Dogg. And he's, you know, the founder of Kendrick Lamar and that tradition. And uh, I've been steadily progressing through that, and that rhythm, that vibe has influenced me, I think. That, that's, what, that's my drawing music in every sense. And it's also very popular culture, which uh, they do a lot of comic stuff, and it's a huge collective of people. And um, I started to build an office and um, at the same time when I experienced uh, George Clinton, uh, I also visited Sork University, and I was more impressed by the real architecture of Louis Kahn than I was of the real architecture of Robert Venturi. And um, I came on New Year's Day to Sork Institute and experienced the American experience. What are you doing here? Hands up. There was a security guard with a drawn pistol like that who said that we were trespassing and that he was not pleased about it. But in a very typical American way, we persuaded him that we were architecture students and we were interested. And he opened up, laughed, put down his revolver and showed everything, every single detail of the building. And, and it was amazing in every sense. Do you recognize this building? It's so wonderful to be completely out of tune with the audience. <laughs> this is one of the very, very famous interiors uh, used in a film, a clockwork orange. This is the clockwork orange. And now that you got this clue, do you know the architect? They, they are a couple designing this. So do you know the female name? The female name is Wendy. Norman Foster. It's one of his earliest buildings. And that, I think that's amazing. But it made also kind of a strong impression because it's, it's just one fluid space with the st uh, steps, not really any windows to the exterior, but windows to the sky. And I was very impressed by all this reasoning about doing lightweight buildings and doing buildings with a minimal impact on the world. I was, um, you know, I, I finalized my exam in 1975, and that was when the oil and energy crisis for the first time was around. And the ideas of Big Must and Fowler was something that Norman Foster in his writing put forward at that time. And I think there's a lot of things in the young works of Foster that is very valid. I also visited the Sea Ranch and this sort of shed architecture that I think has been very, very strong influence on Tainus and Van Kunsten and Dorte Mandrup here in Denmark. It also made a big impression on me. And uh, I also, in the, my early 20s, uh, discovered the film Death in Venice. And um, the, the um, main actor, Dirk Bogard, whose writing ever been an influence on me. And I also, through Venice, uh, discovered Carlos Garpa. And um, his work is also very, very strong on me. The fine detailing the sensuality of the detailing, how the inside sort of manifests the outside, how the windows in the corners are different, how you make variations on everything, and how you can make a very precise focus on precious objects. Those could be humans. Uh, the attention to scale, 
to dramatize, to have a ceiling that's very, very close to you, and the sensibility of few materials. And later on, um, I had a very nice experience. I was in a restaurant in Stockholm in 96, when there came one of the, my female colleagues, and she said, I'm absolutely bored with this man. Can you take him to dinner, please? He's a fine schmecker. And um, you know the man, of course, as you're Swiss. Uh, his name was Peter Zumtour. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't know who he was. But we had a very nice dinner. And um, then I got invited to Finland because Alvar Aalto um, should be 100 years old. And as he turned 100 years old, Juve Eskele wanted to have a building to commemorate him. And they wanted to have an international competition. And they wanted to have a jury that was international. And they asked Peter Zumtour for that. But they also thought he might not come. So they wanted to have a replacement. <laughs> <laughs> so I was sort of, you know, standing in. I was not really part of the jury, but please could you attend? And that was a very, very interesting experience because um, the first day we were seated, they said there will be a lot of entries in this competition. And um, so you have to stay a week to judge them. And you never stay a week in a, in a judging of a competition. And then they said, you can go home for a week, and then you will be here for another week, and the same. So in the end, it was decided that we should spend at least three entire weeks together. And Peter turned out, and uh, Johanne Pavelein, and I saw Mevalle Pavelein and Johanne, I, I don't remember the Finnish, Palisman, it was it Palisman. We, the four of us, uh, we got sort of interlocked in architectural discussions, over a period of three weeks, which was extremely interesting. We started drinking at lunch, and uh, we sort of never went to bed. And uh, Peter Zumtour is, is a very entertaining person, and uh, he had this Brigands art building. And, and I think this is also something that's very, very interesting, to strive for this minimalistic, just the free walls, load-carrying structure, and this way of sort of thinking about things until they, you find now ways, new ways to, to do things and do it with very minimal means. There is also a Swedish architect that influenced me greatly. Over on the other side of the strait is this art museum by Klaus Anselm. Extremely simple drawing, as you can see. They used, there was a tree, you made a small jut in the wall. And it's a very, very nice uniform light in every sense. In it. I visited it earlier today. It's one of the most easy, accessible art spaces that I know. And that sort of finalizes my thoughts on this. Uh, I still dream about this woman. She's dead now, um, Stéphane Audrin. Um, yeah, that, that's why I practice architecture, to have her in my head all the time, I presume. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Are you happy with it? Yes, I am with happy. With the decision you made? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm happy, absolutely, yeah. I think what, what I'm happy about is that, uh, that I'm uh, able to n uh, learn new things all the time, and uh, that's... Um, you sort of meet new clients and you, you change the landscape of, of the values that you're, you're projecting. They are changing all the time. You, you do have to change your viewpoints. Certain things are fixed over a period of time, but you really, really have to adapt. There is a modern word that's used too much, but agility. Mm. The, this is a, a profession that teaches you agility, I think. Um, is agility one of the main Personal characteristics, or how to say that, personal I, I think that's a that positive how, thing to, to, to say I'm, about a person, so I wouldn't contribute it to myself, no. And, but is there uh, something about your uh, personality that helps you 
um, especially to be an architect? Uh, no, no, <laughs> what should that be? <laughs> but I think no, I mean, there is one thing to, to have an idea, but there's also an other thing to project the idea. Mm. So you do have to have an ability to talk. And uh, I started saying that I chose architecture because I could argue mm. in front of people. And I think that's a, a great ability to have, yes. It's true. Yeah. And um, when you look uh, back on your career yeah. um, with three offices, so many great projects. Right, um, yeah. So I would have liked to have focused more on less things. This is what I think. I'm sorry? I would have liked to focus more on fewer things. Okay. Um, yeah. I think it's very easy to get carried away and uh, dilute what you do. So, for example, what you will have loved to... I would have loved to work <laughs> double time on a few of the projects that made them better. Mm. And, but how you do you organize yourself then? Are you, um, this is a part of the process that you especially take yourself as a personal task or is there something that you try to avoid? No, I don't understand. Please repeat. Uh, huh? No, uh, I don't understand your question. Uh, if there is something about the um, um, working as an, as an architect that yeah. you try to, so that you are the, the task for yet at the office, Uh, is this a special task that uh, has to come through you uh, in, the, in this big team? Oh, you think so? No, but I mean, our team, uh, we're, we're sort of like one office, and uh, I have a few people that I work with, with like 30 years. But basically, uh, we, we, I mean, I, I get to see everything and, uh, you know, influence mm. a lot of the things. and. I I like to draw, so I, usually I draw in the weekends, and uh, I like to draw quite detailed drawings and um, execute them to, yeah, and with fine a, detailing. With a big practice. Um, yeah, you can, how, you how can do, you, do more than you think. Yeah. How, can, how you uh, how do you balance professional and private life? Um, well, I, I don't really have to balance that because it's my office. So it's kind of... So they can do the thing. No, no. <laughs> oh, no it, there's, uh, there's no drawing between those, no. But I mean, I, I think still of, of the idea of the day that I like to think of the mornings as, you know, very professional and the nights as very private. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have habits. <laughs> and uh, your wife... But, I mean, there is, there is always this sense between start in white and end up in black. And then again and again. very pure and <laughs> in the end be very shameful about you, what you do. <laughs> But you don't drink alcohol, is this right? Yeah, well, I do. my body doesn't take it anymore. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> you get too much and it, in Good. the end. Now he healthy habits. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there something that you regret of your path? Yeah, I will not go into details about what I regret. <laughs> <laughs> there, there. Not, without going into but, it, no, but, but what I mean is that what I tried to say earlier that is, I, I would have liked to, to put more time in less projects. Mm, yes. And the, I regret that I didn't do that. But I still have the time in front of yeah. me, I think. So I will get more focused. Uh, something that you, were, you have been very um, popular for have been the, your TV series. Le right, yeah. yeah. Uh, sadly, we cannot understand it. Uh, yeah. We would love to be able to understand Swedish. Yeah. Um, how was that for you? Because actually that is an ability to communicate, which is very important as an yeah. architect. Yeah. Um, how was that task for you? No, but it, it, was, it was quite interesting. I, I think that uh, in Sweden, at least, there is a s sort of understanding among architects that we are a bit misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So any opportunity to try to explain architecture in the media, in the newspapers, television or so on, is very um, encouraged and uh, applauded. And uh, I got this opportunity to do this TV series where you follow uh, housing projects uh, from start to finish. And uh, it grew very, very popular in Sweden. And um, it, it was very interesting for me to be in my 60s and not being recognized to be in basically recognized by everybody. And uh, th that's the sort of success that's very nice to have uh, at a late stage in life, I think. So, so it's, it's been very cool for me to be in that way, yeah. 
how do you define success? Um, how do you define success? Um, hopefully that you like what you've done. Hopefully is there you respect a, yourself. Is there um, a way that you would like your work uh, to be uh, remembered? Of course I would like that, but I mean, that's... Um, I, I think th what's interesting to, to work over a period of time is, number one, to have your first buildings torn down, and number two, <laughs> see how their architects improve on them, <laughs> and thirdly, trying to add or improve on them yourself. It, you, you, you understand it's very futile, and I, I more and more get interested in the city and the urban, urban dwelling as a complex thing. And I really enjoy the pictures with, with the worshipping on this leftover space in Joburg. Uh, I think that uh, those kind of places are extremely interesting. And uh, we are also very much more involved now in sustainability issues and sociality issues, uh, how to bring everybody to be participating in, in the building process and that any new building should give something to the community and all those processes. I think the, the sort of what is the definition, what is beautiful and what is ugly, what, what is um, so lovely about Joburg and I, I can really understand what mm. you s sort of talked about in that sense. I'm getting more and more interested in what you can't design and what will happen if you don't design, what <laughs> will emerge, how do you plant a seed to get something to be designed. That's one part of me, and the other one is very much controlling. Mm. So, I, um, yeah. And that, uh, but I think the complexity, I, I really, really like the, the title of that book still, Robert Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction. Life is not simple, mm. and there are a lot of contradictions, and, and learning to live with that I think that's that's success. True. No, yeah. Very nice. A good, very good message. Uh, also for the for the interview, I would like to because now that you mentioned also Samaya, uh, would be a good time to to start with a roundtable discussion. So yet, thank you for your yeah. nice introduction, uh, presentation. Right. Thank you.